I uh, work for Antimac Games. I'm a level designer, and I'm going to just try and dive into a bit of what day-to-day -day role of a level designer actually is, in my experience, because I know back when I was a student, you kind of go, yeah, I could be a level designer, that'd be great, I'll design the levels. But actually, what does that involve, right? And I'm going to try and disambiguate it and just go into it a little bit, um, and hopefully be helpful for those of you that are not looking at design, like the artists among you as well, because um, the likelihood is you're going to be working with level designers at some point, uh, especially if you're in a smaller studio, you'll be working directly with them, most likely. Um, uh, briefly about Antimat Games, they started as a mod team originally, um, which was a pretty interesting and unusual route into becoming a kind of fully fledged studio. But yeah, they started as just a few people making mods, um, and now we're biggest game design uh, studio in the southwest so we got about 50 people so we're not we're not huge by any means but we're yeah mid-size <laughs> um working down in cornwall so what do i do as a level designer i design levels cool and that's it right mm, kind of it's kind of kind of what it is so i'm going to go into that a little bit about it I design levels. There I am, level designer, making the levels. I design a thing, I write down on paper, draw it out. It's done, it's designed. I can then get everyone to make it. That is not at all how it works. So first off, it's not just me, it's not just one level designer, it's a whole team of level designers making things. You're gonna be, you're gonna be talking together a lot. You're gonna be checking each other's work and just wanting to sanity check everything as much as possible with other people in your discipline who all have really good ideas. Um, but that's great, and then the rest of the team can make the stuff for you, but no, because <laughs> there's also there's a design team who have, it's their job to have very definite ideas about how the game should be played, how encounters are going to run, how enemies are going to behave, how what sort of things we want to allow the player to do, um, and so yeah, you've got to take their input on board as well. And then of course there's the art team. We do not just tell the artists what to make, <laughs> and then they go and make it for us. Um, it would be very easy for us if that was how it works, but that's definitely not how it works. So there's less of a, there's a massive gray area there between level design and art about exactly who kind of gets final say on how each each part um, each part goes in the finished product. So we'll tend to block things out and then get feedback from the art team, and then we feedback on their feedback. And there's the, there's a kind of push and pull as to like where we want things to actually end up in terms of the environment and the playability of the space and the looks of the space, it's all its all very kind of closely knit together. So that's all good. You've also got people at the top. These, they have a lot of different names in a lot of different studios, but it's your, your directors, your product owners, your um, executive producers, all sorts, who have very definite ideas about how they want things to go. And you will be hearing about those ideas quite regularly. Um, and you kind of have to take that on board the audio team and that's a big part of making making the space feel like a real real place to inhabit um, and you can't just again tell them what to do that is a collaborative effort got a producer <laughs> you've also got the animation and you've got the code and features team and writers who are trying to tell the story and you so it is never just one person who is making a thing and then that thing gets made so it's not just me it's all these wonderful people who are all professionals with a vested interest on making sure that the levels you're working on show off their work to its fullest and also because of that then the game comes out great in the end so as level design team you tend to get a lot of feedback from all these teams um more so than most most disciplines so if you're an artist or if an artist shows off a piece of work, I go, yeah, that's cool, this looks nice. But I don't have a vested interest in changing how it looks, right? If it, if it fits the bill, it's it's all right by me. It looks nice. But if my level isn't showing off the art, then they have an opinion on that. Same with design, same with the, the systems that are made, same with everything in the game. So you'll find that the levels are kind of where all the different parts of the game sort of mesh together and uh, actually experienced by the player. So you tend to have to work incredibly collaboratively um, and this kind of goes into what's something that Alex and George were both mentioned on that you have to uh, a common 
phrase I heard a lot was like, kill your darlings or kill your babies. Like have to get passionate about what you're working on in order to make it good with the full understanding that it's probably going to get bashed about and changed or completely deleted. Um, and this goes for everyone. Um, this this is a really important skill to have um, is being able to take feedback and not take it personally and seek it out as much as you can, because the more feedback you get from people who are actually involved in it and who know what they're talking about, then the more you can chop it and change it around into what is actually going to be a great product at the end. So design levels. Yeah, but you do a lot more um, than literally just sitting down designing something. So in the different phases of development, you'll do in pre-production a lot of research. So we make um, most of the games we make are very like historically accurate. That's our our kind of thing is like um, historically accurate first-person shooters. That's what we've kind of built our studio up on. And so that involves a lot of research. Um, working on Rising Storm to Vietnam. Every level we made was based on real places in Vietnam. We had to do a lot of Vietnam war research, which I'm glad I don't have to do anymore. <laughs> but um, everything's based on uh, realism. And if you're making a fantasy game, you still need to do your research. Um, and you're doing exploratory designs. In fact, in the pre-production, this is probably where you feel the most like you are a designer as an, as an LD, because you're doing uh, sort of quick, quick prototypes, quick kind of sketches, if you like, of level, see what works, see what doesn't, try out, make a little level to test out specific mechanics, specific prototypes. You're um, doing a lot of planning and a lot of uh, trying to figure things out and sort of, hey, does this work? Does this not work? How are we going to approach this? And yeah, watching the producers um, have a horrible time because everyone's trying to plan everything and there's never enough time for everything that the rest of the team wants to do. And then when you come to the main development, you are going to be blocking out levels first. So most studios um, will make the levels before art get involved, gets involved in any meaningful way. Yeah, the artists might make a uh, kind of like proxy kits, so like simple uh, representative uh, kits um, for the level designers to use. Um, but a lot of the time, level designers will also make their own bits and pieces to use. Um, it varies a lot between different studios, like that relationship between level design and art is something that changes massively from, from studio to studio. Um, but you'll block out your levels and you'll try them and then you'll realize they don't work. And so you'll block them out again. Um, and that will hopefully only happen a few times, but it'll probably happen more than that. And then you'll probably think you've got it right. And then a mechanic changes or does I want to try something different? And so you have to do it again. And all of that, you are collaborating with the rest of the team. Um, that is the really important thing. Everyone is in it together and trying to work together to, to make things the best they can, you know, iterating on it. And you will start to fix bugs. So like, in my experience, the earlier you get QA involved, the better, um, because you can pick things up earlier. And so you'll be getting, uh, you'll be getting people pulling up stuff and saying, hey, this doesn't work. And you're slowly narrowing your focus so ideally once you've got a block out that you're reasonably satisfied with as a team then i'll start working on it and you'll 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 start narrowing the focus of your design so you'll be like, okay so the level is in general works what about this area let's make this bit really work let's make this bit really work and you're getting smaller and smaller and working on the finer and finer details um but it, while you're doing that well even if you're spending two days just like um copy and pasting wall sections, which happens quite often, um, you can still be thinking as a designer. So like, I don't consider a lot of what I do day to day as I am sitting down and designing something, but it is all contributing in small like incremental ways to an overall design. So you still need to keep that, uh, like keep that designer hat on, if you like, um, to try and make sure that it's all fitting together. And then later you, <laughs> you might still be making blockouts, but hopefully that's all happened. But there's still this this churn of um, things changing. Um, art's coming to the maps, the starting to look pretty. Then we've got some collision bugs that you need to sort out. Um, or again, things can things can shift around as you. Everyone is trying to. All the different disciplines are trying to like kind of tweak it and perfect it and mold it into something that's uh, that's beautiful and works really smoothly. And you get so 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 much bug fixing. So QA are in full full steam ahead at this point because um, as soon as you say something's finished, then that means people can legitimately pick a load of holes in it. Um, 
and saying, well, it's not, look, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, this doesn't work. And that's great because without that, you send it out the door and it would it would not work <laughs> at all. Uh, and the focus now is more and more and more and more. So uh, this can be very different. Like I've worked on multiplayer games and single player games and the the process for each is is like wildly different. With multiplayer games, you tend to be making more a a playground where people can make their own experiences in. Um, where single player games, you are like really tightly like defining a, a specific experience that you want people to have and like guiding them along along that. Even if the experience you want them to have is an a kind of open world, do what you want thing, you're still conscious of sculpting that and kind of like the order in which you want them to, to um, encounter the systems that you bring in front of them and be able to do whatever you have there. And again, you're always thinking like a designer, you're kind of working towards this uh, this holistic experience at the end of it. Um, and design levels. Let's make levels. Well, if you remember this, um, this slide, all, almost all of these people, these disciplines, combine to make a level, all right? So it, without art or without um, like features from the code team or writing or animations, I literally wouldn't be able to make a level. <laughs> I wouldn't have anything to make it with or anything to put in it. Um, and so you you end up becoming a generalist as, as a level designer all the time, because you're working with all these different parts, these like different moving parts that are sliding together. Um, and more than most disciplines that I've encountered, you become the um, the engine specialist. Like you get, you really get to know the engine you're working in. It's, it's Unreal 4 for us, um, but because you need to know all the little tips and tricks of how to put these things together. Um, so yeah, you really do end up learning about um, a lot more than just just specifically the levels and how to make levels good. You need to know a little bit about how to implement animations, how audio setups work how to use all the, the tools that code have made for you, um, how to, you need to optimize. So you need to know a little bit about how um, rendering works and you know how to, how LODs on the art pieces that you've got are working and all this kind of stuff, how to, how to uh, time things for the story, everything. So what I do, I do design levels, right? But it's mm, kind of, it's, it's more complicated. <laughs> um, and yeah, that is, a brief rundown. So if anyone does want to know anything about uh, the role or me or the company, then shoot, go for it. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Um, anyone got any questions? Declan, you have a question. Um, hi, so you worked on um, Rising Storm Vietnam, which is it's obviously it's kind of competitive. People take it very uh, role play esque, I suppose. They can do, way. yeah. Different servers, you get different uh, different attitudes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, in terms of creating levels for something like that, a lot of my kind of inspiration and background with like level design stuff that I kind of enjoy is a lot of like competitive stuff. So, are there any elements that you could maybe kind of relate from Rising Storm Vietnam levels to maybe something like a Counter Strike level or a Valorant level, for example? Uh, I mean, this, it's just the scale is the most different thing, right? And the fact that in uh, Rising Storm is asymmetric, so like the different, the two different teams have access to different equipment, different kind of weaponry, and also tend, uh, the most popular mode is like there's an attacker and defender, so it's, it's always kind of skewed, so you can't, the balance isn't quite as simple as just um, making things the same on both sides of the map. Um, I can't speak to Valorant. Um, but I, mean, I think if you're trying to design for a specific like genre, then like playing around that genre, I think is is really beneficial. So like not just its immediate like kind of cousins or competitors, but things which are like tangentially related. You know, you can draw inspiration from all sorts of places. Um, uh, like I'm a big board gamer, card gamer, all sorts of things, and I really like kind of mixing and matching design ideas. Awesome, thank you, Declan. Um, Rowan, we have a question from Rowan. Hello, um, I was gonna ask, it's not entirely just level um, uh, level design focused, but just kind of a general question. Um, when you were talking about like sort of the whole specializing or generalizing thing, I kind of was thinking like, 
if I've worked in one particular engine and I have a lot of, well, not a lot of experience, but a decent amount of experience in that one engine, would it be a good idea to stick with that engine and continue making games in that engine or to try and make a game in, like, so, for instance, I've made a game in um, Unity. Is it a good idea that I then make a, maybe a simple game in Unreal so I get that sort of experience and that knowledge of how to work in Unreal to then allow me to get more... Uh, job opportunities in terms of portfolio basically yeah yeah um i think either like to be honest a lot of stuff you can do in a game engine is um is applicable to others like it's just the specific means you go about achieving it changes a lot so the ui is different like kind of the the way it's set up is different but the same principles like underlie all of them so I, I don't think we'd reject someone just because they were really, really good in Unity and hadn't got much Unreal experience, for example, if they were a good designer or an LD or something. Um, like I'd, I'd, I'd been working in Unity. I used Unity at, um, at uni, and when I started doing that, we were <laughs> made RS2 in Unreal 3, so that was interesting. <laughs> um, but yeah, that 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 was the first time I touched the engine was when I when I went into work on the first day and got into it. And it is, and it is finding out where things are. Um, but yeah, if you know how to how games work, then you'll be okay. Um, obviously, if there's a specific job you're going for, it's better to be able to show that you can use the engine that they use that company. Like it is a definite plus, but I don't think it's going to close many doors for you, in my opinion. What if that specific company uses an in-house engine? Well, exactly. You can't practice in that, can you? <laughs> so, um, so use what you feel comfortable with. I mean, if you're, there's a lot to be gained from messing around in different engines and different tool sets. Um, I, like you, absolutely should if you're interested in it. But it depends what you're trying to do. What if what you're trying to do is make a specific project? Use whatever tools you feel most comfortable using to make that project, and then you can show off. Hey, I made this thing. Um, like showing off one amazing thing that you've made in Unity is going to be better than showing off two crappy Unreal prototypes you made. You know. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Rowan. Uh, Declan, I think you've already been. If you just not put your hand down, uh, Joshua. Joshua Gray, got a question. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. We can. Uh, yeah. Um, what qualities or characteristics are need are needed for a um? level designer to be more appealing like is there a certain mindset that they need to have or it's unfortunately difficult to show um like in paper but being able to collaborate and talk with and talk with people and work with a variety of people um i mean like so you, you kind of sit at the middle of a lot of different disciplines and you need to be able to interact with all those disciplines and not not piss any of them off and be happy <laughs> um but beyond that, no, it, it is the team player stuff. And that is really hard to get across, I have to say. Um, being able to take feedback really well and just put yourself down, put yourself to a task, because you're going to be doing very different things at different stages of development as well. And so just being able to knuckle down and get on with it is very important. All right. Cheers. The mic's not coming through now, uh, Nick. Was oh you're muted. Sorry, thank you, Sorry. Nathan. Uh, I was just saying, go ahead uh, with the question. Thank you. Um, so I've kind of got two two questions. My first one is, um, a lot of from what I've seen, level designer for designers is uh, considered an, a kind of an entry level specialism. Um, so is that true? And then the second question is, you were mentioning in your presentation that as a level designer you work quite closely and you get quite a knowledge of all spectrums of the industry you know you work with artists programmers and then with when Tim was talking about QA earlier he also mentioned that QAs pick up a lot of skills because they're deeply embedded with every discipline so that being said is can QA line up quite nicely to work as a level designer in the future as a kind of like a path uh, honestly, I think it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, um, we don't have in-house QA, so I don't have a lot of experience with like them transferring into other things. We um, we use another company for our QA, um, 
but yeah, I mean, it, it's directly applicable. You're, you're seeing a little bit of everything. Uh, the difference is, I, I think it depends how different QA teams run. Um, some QA teams don't like see the problem, report the problem. They don't dive into how to fix the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, sure. So it's like a, that, that next step. Um, but yeah, in terms of being an entry level thing, I think that probably depends a lot on the company. Like we we have a separate level design team and a game design team. And you have, we have a lead level designer, lead designer. So it's, it's like a, a separate but adjacent thing. Sure, um, yeah. So yeah, I, th I think you need fewer, it depends so much on what game you're working on. I was going to say, typically you probably need fewer systems designers than you do level designers because mm -hmm. you're going to making a few systems and then putting them in a lot of different levels. So yeah. in, that, in that way, there are probably more companies where you get more slightly lower level level designers. Mm -hmm. um, and the extreme being the work. Yeah, exactly. But it differs a lot. Like I could imagine something like Street Fighter, your level design, you're like, mm, let's make it flat again. And yeah. That's about it. <laughs> so they probably don't really have any. Um, it changes so much based on the genre and the game. Sure. Company. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Well, thanks for that. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Nathan. Anyone else got any qu Oh, Phil. Phil, we've got Phil. Where are we? Here we are. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me OK? Yes. Yep. Yeah, perfect. Um, I just wanted to ask around, um, obviously, being a level designer, it looks like it's quite a political and collaborative effort of balancing between quite a lot of different teams. Um, I was just wondering if you had any experiences where necessarily, like particular teams weren't budging on like a feature change or you sort of hit like a crossroads where people end up kind of butting heads. I mean, I don't think it happens too often in the industries. Most people are pretty chill. But have you ever had any kind of experience where that has happened and what kind of outcomes come from that okay. how does that get resolved so i'm going to need to give you a reasonably political answer for this <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah you're working with a lot of people who tend to be quite chill but also quite passionate about the thing they're working on and especially um their section of it um so there are there are definitely it, it can be difficult at first when you first start working in the industry or in a team to distinguish between um, like genuine heated debates about like what's best for the game or actual like clashes about things because there's a there's a kind of fine line. It's hard to tell exactly when that's crossed sometimes. Um, and most of the time it's not. Most of the time people are just um, um, arguing a point because they believe different sides of an issue. They're not actually getting um, angry at each other. Um, I can say there were, when we first all had to start working from home, for the kind of COVID, COVID stuff like a year or so ago, um, it took us a while to realize that all those little incidental uh, chats that you have in the office that kind of keep everyone up to date on what the other teams are doing, like weren't happening. Um, so there was for a little while, a bit more of that like uh, siloed kind of feel. So like the level designers were talking to the level designers a lot and the artists were talking to the artists a lot, but there wasn't anything in place regularly for like the different teams to kind of come together and just keep each other update. Um, and that led to a couple of like misunderstandings and clashes um, in general, which we've sorted out now, which is good. Uh, quite quickly identified that we need like different meeting structures compared to when you're working in an office together. Because um, you don't go for a coffee with someone. Like I don't go for a coffee with the lead artists anymore. I haven't seen him for a year. <laughs> I got people with the linkedin anniversaries been working on my company for a year who i've literally never met it's, it's a weird time <laughs> actually um if i could just ask a quick question just about the remote um working i know a lot of companies i'm not sure if anyone here is allowed to mention it but a lot of companies are going blended next you know they're, they're having new contracts where you do a mix of in office and at home uh have, have any of your companies decided to adopt a similar thing do you think there's going to be a change going forward or are you not allowed uh, to discuss it? We uh, well, we got it on our website. We 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 are going to be having uh, Wednesdays and Fridays. People can work from home if they want um, when we come back um, to add a bit more flexibility. Okay. Um, anyone else? Does, it, does anyone anyone else have a similar thing with their, the companies yeah. they work for? Um, so Media Tonic are moving. So we're fully remote right now, and we will be until uh, about January. Um, and after that, everyone will be they can go into the office two days a week if they want to um because of the explosion of media tonic though um they don't have an office capable of now bringing everyone on site on the same day um which i think has happened to a lot of companies growth over the last year 
But, yeah, it happened yeah. to us. Yeah, same thing. Yeah. We've moved um, offices. No one's ever been in it. But yeah, yeah same. Same. <laughs> we did. Totally. No one's ever been to the new offices that they've got last February. Um, so, yeah, working remote from every job that I looked at in the last year is just going to be the norm for a lot of companies, at least a day or two a week. Okay. Thank you. We're an industry um, that can do it. It's really nice. Um, mm. Would that yeah, make it slightly more difficult to onboard um, juniors and graduates in a remote setting rather than a in a in person? Do you think? Um, I don't know if it'd be more difficult. It'd be slightly different. I think is is probably mm. the the end result. Like we've got a couple of um, interns at the moment who are working in in our office with just like a couple of people. Um, sure. I'm taking a couple of design interns this year. Um, I, I was going to say, I think it, 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 you, as, a, as the person coming in, you need to make sure you're really proactive in speaking in chats. If there are any like group days and stuff, I think that's mm. where it will be different is you're not forced to interact with people. Mm -hmm. um, it's up to you. Yeah, 100%. Cool. Yeah, that is true. That like um, social becoming part of a team uh, stuff rather than the specific way you're doing, but the actual... Um, integrating yourself into into the team you probably have to work a bit harder right yeah, true. um just in terms of tom with with your it's a bit of a mediocre question i suppose but a lot of people we've had talking so far today have graduated from solent and they've described their what happened after that point between that and them getting a job uh, does that reflect your experiences uh, graduate from different, different university other commonalities there or did you have a unique a unique experience uh, I think everyone's got a bit of a different different path to it. I, uh, yeah, graduated in Falmouth um, as a mature student. I had been doing some work for um, someone who was associated with the uni who was trying to set up a game a game studio, um, and I did and didn't have any budget for it. And I was doing unpaid work for him. My attitude was basically say yes to everything I could say yes to for a while. Um, and so and so I did that and was doing some design work for him, some level design stuff. Um, and he was uh, also ended up working for Antimat Games, and so I ended up being taken on by them. They um they had like gaps in the level design department uh, just after I finished uni, and so he suggested I come along. So I, I didn't have an official interview. I kind of had a slightly. I I had an informal chat, which is another word for an interview that, that wasn't an interview. It was it was a bit a bit strange, but it worked very well. I, I um. And yeah, seg segued in. I, I, my first day was the launch day of, the, of Rising Storm 2, the project they were working on, <laughs> which was a surreal time to start a company. Um, but everyone was happy, at least. <laughs> Not what you know, it's who you know. Yeah, well, it's a bit of both. Um, it, it, it's it's who you know, but it, it's more importantly what those people know about you. Mm, yeah. So, like, you do, know, you do need to make friends with the right people, but you also, Proof if they them. know you... But they don't think you're very good or very good to work with. Then there's there's no point. So, yeah. Good point. Um, has anyone else got any questions for Tom? We've only got a couple of minutes left. So, okay, Tom, thank you so much. That was awesome. Thank you very much indeed.